Hey, this is Tony Kenyas, and uh, before we start today's podcast, I, I, I've been asked to, to add the following to, to, to the beginning of it, because we weren't able to get it during the actual recording. Uh, Boston University is working to, on, so we're working to offer expertise regarding insurance solutions for the coronavirus, and the Lazy School of Business is, uh, offers an online Master of Science degree in risk management and, and insurance. Uh, we talk a little bit uh, about the programs at Butler, but but they they wanted us to make sure that we mentioned specifically that they have an online Master of Science in Risk Management and Insurance. With that, let's move on to the podcast. Hello, and welcome to Profiles in Risk, and this is your host, Tony Canyas. And today, I have with me Professor Zach, that's what I know him as, uh, Professor Zach Finn of the uh, Butler University I think I think it's the Davy Risk Management and Insurance Program at Butler University. Right. Uh, we've been connected for for a good while and exchanging ideas, kind of on LinkedIn. And finally, we we met last year at at Gamma Delta Sigma. Right. And then all of a sudden, uh, this uh, coronavirus thing went crazy and, and and starting having an effect or a potential effect on our insurance industry. And now you've got a heck of a story. Uh, yeah, so, a little uh, bit. So I want to I want to kind of take it for, for, from the beginning. And by the way, those of you watching on video, uh, he is wearing a really cool Superman shirt, not the traditional Superman shirt. And so five minutes ago, he dials in, and, and I'm like, <laughs> uh, know your uh, audience, Tony. Know your audience. <laughs> exactly. So so I very much had to ask whether this was a uh, a special dress for occasion for for you know, because because he's chatting with me. Uh, which it is. So we'll we'll also chat a little super about it here here and there because I really appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, so Professor Zach, uh, I I don't come from the risk management side. I come from the carrier side and now carrier staffing. Uh, so uh, I know you come from the risk management side and then to academia. So can, kind of quickly walk us through through your background. Yeah. So I would like it in this way. Imagine if you self-taught yourself in finance or you got a 40-hour license in finance and then you ran into somebody who had an undergrad and master's degree in finance. You would think it was witchcraft, right? They'd be talking about derivatives and things and you, you wouldn't understand. And, you know, I'm good at my job, I think. I'm very knowledgeable. But frankly, I have an undergraduate degree in, in risk management insurance from Indiana State University. And if Dr. Marianne Boos is listening anywhere out there, I love Dr. Marianne Boos. She's a great professor. And frankly, we're all here because of her. I also have a master's in risk management insurance from Florida State University. So if uh, Dr. Kathleen McCullough is out there listening, um, um, great, great love to my friends at Florida State. Because frankly, anyone who has the background I have um, could be doing what I'm doing right now. And, and, and there are a lot of Fortune 500 risk managers who could be doing it, except they have companies to save. They're all busy right now. It's, it's, it's just a really unique problem and a really unique set of circumstances. I'm a very well-trained and educated risk manager. Um, I worked and I had a lot of experiences that informed how I view this, by the way. So when people say, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about, I think maybe we better unpack that a little bit. I was an intern at the National Cash Register Company in 1999. So I sat in a room while people debated whether money was going to shoot out of ATMs and whether we wanted that to be insured or whether we didn't want that to be insured, whether we wanted to manuscript it, whether we wanted to use an ISO form. And, and, and nobody liked the answers to any of those questions. In fact, we, we had... Go ahead. Yeah, Hold on. Time out. Ta yeah. ta time out. For 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 our uh, for our younger crowd. Oh yeah, all right. I uh, forgot about he's, that. Old. He, he's referring to this crazy thing called Y two K, which basically we thought all computers were gonna go hi haywire when the clock uh, when we went from from December thirty first ninety nine to January first two thousand. In fact, uh, I, I went to school for computer science uh, shortly after. Uh, I, I missed it, but but. Uh, so that's yeah, what, basically, what it was. basically everything that's happening right now is you're hunkered in your house eating canned corn. That's all what we thought was going to happen after 9 uh -huh. 11, but it didn't happen. But, so, 9 11, uh, so, so, no, 9 11. Uh, 9 11, you're right. So, what the problem, though, is I, is I went through, I was buying $200 million in aviation insurance on 9 11, literally. I mean, literally, I had the quote rescinded that morning and reissued later that day at four times the price. So, I mean, I see some crazy stuff. My career has been nothing but 9-11s and Fukushima's and Katrina's and <laughs> largest fraud, world's largest sexual harassment. I can't watch Bill Cosby, my kids no more. I mean, you know, that's why I got concerned. That's why I got concerned when Tom Hanks got sick, Tony. We don't have many nice things left in this country. Tom that, Hanks. That is true. That is true. Past. So when during Y2K, I watched as we, um, you know, and again, I don't speak for NCR. I don't remember exactly what happened, but um, I remember we put in force policies that we thought would respond to the way to Y2K the way that we wanted to. And then we ended up having to do what's known as a policy reformation, where we basically said, okay, this policy 
doesn't cover exactly what we thought it was going to cover. We can demonstrate the intent of that in our renewal correspondence. That's why risk managers, you always save your renewal correspondence and your policies because then you can go back and demonstrate intent and we can go back and reform the policy, which you could do that with TRIA now, something like that. Um, then I had a career where I did nothing but do business. You know, I did all kinds of risk management. I did business interruption, um, uh, supply chain mapping, contingent business interruption. I could tell you how much money my plant would lose per hour. I could tell you how much plant my, lose, my plant would lose per hour if key suppliers went down. Um, um, we did pandemic preparedness. I mean, I was, I was getting... I want to give a shout out to Les Young at the Hayes Company, my insurance broker. Les Young and the Hayes Company and Lynn Little, and they're now part of Brown and Brown, they did something called a gap report. Every year we'd sit down with our executives and we'd say, this is the coverage you have, this is the limits, this is the deductible, here's all the coverages that exist that you might want, and by the way, if you don't take these coverages, um, um, you better sign off on that. And so as, you, as, as people think about like, oh, we don't want to have a pandemic covered under, under TRIA, they need to think about all the liability here. I mean, we'll talk about in my career some of the coverage litigation I think you can have, and I'm going to use some examples about a loss scenario, um, but if you're an, an, an agent, think about it. And I don't mean a retail agent, right? I had a license. They don't cover pandemics in that, but if you're an agent to the Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, and you didn't offer pandemic insurance, you didn't do a gap report, you better put your E&O carrier on notice. If you're, an, if you're a risk man, if you're a company, you don't have a risk manager, is that a D&O claim? If your risk manager doesn't have a background like mine, is that a D&O claim? If you don't have business disruption values, is that DNO claim? If you don't have contingent business disruption values, is that DNO claim? I keep going all day long if you people want. I mean, that's the thing. Is you're going to have to do this or you're going to pay it in court. The only people who would be happy would be the trial lawyers and me because I'll be an expert witness and I'll call fair balls and strikes. And, I, and we looked at a policy in class today. We studied business disruption event cancellation policies at Butler. We reviewed a policy form for a major blue chip company today for event cancellation. I guarantee you coronavirus is covered. There's no exclusions in there that, that, that listed. It says if the main performer is sick, covered. I mean, I could pull the policy out right now and go through it step by step, but I don't want to identify the carrier of their coverage form. Interesting. So, so, so uh, was this an ENS form or, or was this a No, it's a, a standard. Form. I mean, I, as far as I can tell, it's a standard admitted market form for a major really? carrier. What, 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 I mean, what all I've these policies is... are out there. You can get them online. I mean, Risk Genius studies them, but if you do the DICE process, the, you know, declaration page, insurance agreement, conditions, exclusions, endorsements, some of these they're covered and some of these they're not. And, and I use another example for my career. I once had a tornado that destroyed a warehouse and there was $15 million of product sitting out in the open. Some of it was damaged, but some of it, the product inside was probably fine. We didn't, wouldn't know. I don't want to tell who it was, right? But um, we got it to be agreed to be a total loss because the health inspector said it was dirty. They wrote in their report, this product's dirty and dirty equal damage. The claims adjuster signed off on it. Ding, ding, boom. $15 million claim paid. So, so when you think about legislatures and courtrooms all across America, every single constituent is pissed. This is not Katrina where it's just the people in Louisiana getting this. Every American has business disruption claims. Reaching out to their congressman saying, this is horseshit. What do they think is going to happen? And then they're going to start making arguments. Well, this is not dirty because that coronavirus in it. Well, if you ever paid a claim for anything that was dirty, and you could see why the insurance company did it. We didn't want to recover that inventory. You would have had to have 70% of it be good for the ROI to be there. You would have needed 500 semi trucks, a warehouse for three months, tied up all the quality people, and and, and had the company maybe risk a, a product recall because the quality people all tied up, getting inventory to be deemed a total loss. So a lot of these insurance companies they, they do the easy thing. That's just a total loss. They they, uh, um, they cover because it's dirty. So let, let's back up a whole bunch. I, I love how yeah. passionate you you are about the issue. Okay. So so there's a lot in this um, man. I, I uh, the the event policies. Uh, what what I've heard is is that most of them people didn't choose the the uh, the pandemic uh, no no the the, the uh, communicative communicative disease option right. uh, so so you did it yourself there uh, but but I think where where the, where the biggest uh, dilemma is going to be is the business interruption right because because yeah so so a lot of events got canceled but every business basically every every business that has a retail presence all of Main Street us butler uh, we're out millions of dollars and we're now suspending hiring suspending contractors suspending construction delaying renovations when was the last time you saw a commercial for an airline a sporting event or a cruise who's paying those losses i mean this is like contagion mm -hmm. rippling through the economy so, and and you're right anybody in the fortune 500 who who has someone like me as a risk manager or deals with someone like me as a broker or less young at the hayes company you know, they had their shot, they had their fair chance, but this is where middle America and middle mm -hmm. market was let down. 
Nobody, nobody done came up before. I had an insurance license, a 40 hour license. I got seven years of degrees. So, so the Fortune 500 gets advised by somebody like me with seven years of degrees. And if you're a business person trying to make a living, you get someone not to disrespect anybody with a 40 hour insurance license, by the way, those people would become, they come into a great experience education. They get great experience education. But, but my point is, is that there could be another way. You can get someone with a degree. And, and, and when you're starting to deal with some really sophisticated businesses, you know, maybe you need more than that license. And, and, and maybe those businesses weren't given a fair shot to get coverage that they deserve. And when you look at business interruption, you start looking at ingress, egress, so civil authority. There, there you, 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 you do have a, a solid argument that, yeah, your, your average company, your, 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 your middle market, main street, small business, yeah, they, they don't have risk managers with, with seven years of, of, of risk management education. Uh, they, 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 yeah, they, they didn't have, right, your, your average commercial lines agents would not have identified the, the, this risk and given them a heads up. Okay, and it's not fair to ask them to. Right. It's not fair to give them any you know, so, exposure for it. So, so um, the, the business interruptions are generally in the industry called BI. So it's, yeah. it's funny, I, 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 I started my career in claims uh, in personalized claims, so so in in my brain, BI still means bodily injury, but but so BI as as in business income, so so the 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 the, my, the majority of the standard the ISO business income policies, very much don't cover this, right? Uh, I mean, honestly, I could go get the CPC Institute handbook of insurance policies. I'm in the Davies Center here, where you know actually we're trying we were trying to get an insurance company to endow the Center for Risk and Insurance Education so that we could take what we've done at Butler and, and replicate this around other universities because the idea for the Pandemic Risk Insurance Act, and we can talk about this later, but that started with a bunch of students in a case competition. Is their idea. I, I, that's really cool, but let, let, me, let me back, back down. For, first, I, 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 want, I want to help our, our, our listeners, many of whom are newer to insurance. And if, if this particular episode goes, goes viral, which it very much might if, 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 your, if your quest uh, gets anywhere close to, to succeeding. I want to make sure that the non-insurance crowd that normally doesn't use to us, disruption insurance is like so, the, like like so, high level. So so business interruption insurance we can cover that in thirty seconds. Bas basically, if your business shuts down for for a covered reason, uh, we bring in forensic accountants to to figure out how much you lost, you lose, and we pay you part of that while you get back on your feet. Right. A plus. Uh, right? A. Exactly. Super quick explanation. Right. So. Now, those policies, here's where it gets interesting. And this is where, where the insurance people, where the newer insurance people need to understand. Insurance companies are not banks. They're kind of re the reverse of, of banks, uh, right? And, and a lot of people uh, see us as banks. They, they, they think, I pay my premium, and now I have access to, to, this, to this money behind the scenes that right. is basically, from my perspective, unlimited, right? Oh, right, no. And, no. And, and, and that's not at all how, how it is. Uh, in, in fact, uh, it, it, it comes down to, to you know, a, a small commercial policy. We might be charging you, I, I think, insurance nerds policy, uh, which is a minimum limit, uh, like a minimum charge policy because we're tiny. We have no employees. Uh, we pay like 600 bucks a year, right? So, so if you think about it, uh, my carrier, and I'm not going to mention them this time. I've thanked them before on the show, but I'm not going to mention them this time. Uh, they're taking 600 bucks, and they're taking a million-dollar risk on, right. on the liability side, right? So, right. so. It, right and, and they need everybody six hundred dollars and 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 then they pay out whoever the unlucky i always i use this example in the class mm. there's 50 houses in my neighborhood if they're all worth three hundred thousand dollars and only one of them is going to burn down you can gamble that you're going to be one of the lucky ones that doesn't burn down or you could lose everything or we could all come together and say let's all kick in six thousand bucks and whichever one of us burns down that's what pays and and then we go to the next neighbor we got a hundred people now it's three thousand dollars and so that's exactly how pooling works but the money that goes in for property and fire is there for property and fire. You can't just decide, you can't magically say insurance company, you got to cover pandemics. Where's that money going to come from? It's not there. So, Don't bank so exactly. What, what, what people don't understand is, is that, that depending on the line, depending on the year. And I found this mind blowing when, when I learned this about eight months into working in insurance, ultimately our margin is tiny, right? Ultimately on, on, on a good year, you might run like a 98% loss ratio uh, and which basically means that we paid out 98 cents for a dollar we brought in. And in fact, right. a lot of years, the entire industry runs over a hundred, basically meaning we paid out more than came in. The only reason that it manages to work ultimately is because we can invest the money in between. 
And what people don't 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 realize is that 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 there's a lot of math, the, the actuaries, and I'm very involved in placing actuaries in, 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 in different jobs, so I'm getting to know that side better and better. Uh, the, the actuaries basically make sure that, that we are charging the right price to be able to cover the overall losses. So, right. so the big problem here is we were not charging a premium to cover this particular risk. So yeah, the money is just not no, there, right? It would right? be like if you, if you put this, well, we don't have sports anymore, but it would be like if you had a spread on a ball game <laughs> and then you decided to, well, you're going to pay the bet out anyway. You, you already know the outcome and you didn't collect the money that way. I mean, that, that's the way you take insurance complicated stuff and you try to make it into something in your everyday life. But yeah, you just can't go around. And that's, and that's frankly why the insurance industry has to support the Pandemic Risk Insurance Act. I, and I know, and, and I'm not calling for them to pay for this loss, by the way. The ultimate risk share can be decided between them and the government. I don't really care what it is, right? It's just, it's just, you know, imagine if your neighborhood got hit by the world's first tornado and coverage was unclear or untested. Love that. Would you want someone a thousand miles away to decide you need money and I don't based on what? Their political views? I don't want that. You don't want that. I'm going to have a funny idea. Give everybody a loss advance, send an adjuster out, and then pay everybody a percentage of their damage. If it's nothing or a hundred thousand, you get a percent. There's one more piece that I think is really important, uh, which which I learned at CPCU 500. You probably learned in Risk Management 101, uh, but but basically uh, in CPCU they call it the five characteristics of of a perfectly insurable insurable risk, and you also learn the risks that are not insurable, and essentially anything that's catastrophic uh, is not insurable in the private market, and and, and right, right. So if it, it, if if a whole area gets hit at the same time, it's why it floods so hard. Right. If 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 a whole area gets hit at the same time, there's no way to insure right. that in in the commercial market, right? So, which is what happened with terrorism, right? How we ended up with with Tria. 9/11 happened, a black swan, and all of a sudden, everybody is exposed to to the possibility of of losses from terrorism. We have no idea how, how to handle that, uh, you know, in, a, 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 in private insurance. And also how the flood program, the national flood program, right? Because if 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 a uh, you know if if all of Southern California gets flooded, no insurance company can survive. So Tony, consider this. Consider this, because I you know I, I think this honestly, this whole like, this whole crisis comes down to the fact that there's not enough insurance at risk manager programs at Gamma to Sigma is not in every business school in America. I mean, think about this for a second. Oh. Yeah. You're, you're talking uh, about the tenets of it. You're talking about the tenets of insurability. I mean, think about it. People in Congress. You wouldn't have a bunch of non-accountants out there debating GAP. I don't know anything about accounting. I'm not going to sit there and debate you on GAP accounting. But why the hell would somebody who doesn't have an insurance degree want to sit here and legislate or try and legislate out something to be insured? It's the six tenets of insurability. You can't insure stuff that's going to impact everybody at the same time. I could go home tonight, Tony, and my house could be on fire and your house is fine. But guess what? We're both stuck inside because of the same loss. And that's the problem. Exactly. So, 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 so huge. And there's a lot of, so there, yeah, there's a lot of technical reasons. We only need people to understand kind of the basic ones. Right. Uh, right. The, the, the congressman. Yeah. When, the, you, the, when you're the, an insurance professor, it's hard to stay out of the, you know, uh, the mini yeah, So, so the, the, the congressman's version, right. It, it, it's, it's that simple. If you force the, 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 the insurance industry to cover something catastrophic, like, like, yeah. like this particular loss, where too many businesses are affected at the same time and they were not collecting premium. For that, you can't change your spread without collecting the bets. You, you're going to drive a lot of insurance companies out, out, out of business, and, and then you've got a bigger problem, right? Uh, You'll destabilize and, markets. You'll, and, and right now, by the way, I mean, how, how can event cancellation and the business interruption insurance continue? Indianapolis, you were both wearing Superman shirts. I know you know about Gen Con, right? How are you going to have Gen Con, one of the largest gaming conventions here in Indianapolis, how are you going to have that if we're all quarantined? And how will you how will you as an entity prepare to have a convention in the future in a world where you could be shut down for two months at any given time? It can't exist. It it either has to be excluded by the policy or it has to be in, insured in a in, in but it would in have a to be insured. I mean, how could you have an economy with those industries mm -hmm. going forward? How could you run a convention center in a world without event cancellation insurance that does include pandemics? You wouldn't be able to plan for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. So, so 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 okay so 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 now that we kind of define the, the the basic problem of of how quite simply this would literally run several or most or all but at least several insurance companies out out, out of business uh, creating a huge problem in the market in something that right. that ultimately is necessary for the functioning of the, of the economy uh, so so 
there's a terrorism act, right? That's been around since 20, what, 2000, 2002, right after 9-11, basically, right. yep. uh, which helped the economy continue given the, the, the newfound risk of, of terrorism domestically right. uh, and stabilized the, the, the market. So, so now tell me about, about Priya. What, what the heck is Priya? We ha I had never heard the, the letters Priya before well, last I, week. I, 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 to the best of my knowledge, uh, well, I, did, I didn't make it up, actually. I have to take co-credit with some Butler University students here. And, um, you know, we want to work with them to have them identify themselves and respect their privacy. But every year we compete in the Spencer Educational Foundation RIMS Risk and Insurance Management Challenge. And what that is is where we get some of the best insurance and risk management minds from great programs, Temple University, Florida State, Indiana State, Ball State, great programs that are out there producing people just like me. I'm not, I'm not special. There's just plenty of people like me. They're just, we need more programs that are doing it. But every year, the best and brightest students get assigned a company like PayPal or Disney or Snap-on Tools and then, and then given a risk management case study. So basically, for the last eight years, I've been studying black swan events with students and coming up with like worst case, breaking case emergency scenarios that would never happen. And so we had some students that did a case competition at PayPal. And they envisioned a scenario just like this involving a cyber attack. In fact, envision if that happened right now. Imagine if North Korea and, and Iran saw how close to the brink we were, and they decided to turn off our Netflix, right? If I don't get my Joe Exotic, <laughs> we're done. I mean, think about it. That's what's holding society together right now is Netflix. If, if we get hacked and we lose Netflix and online banking and internet and all these other things, we're done. You know, so, so their, their, their contention was, and, and I know this from, from having a location in New Orleans where we had a $600 million flood exposure, we could only get $50 million for the flood insurance. That's all that existed. So what do you do with that extra liability? Well, when you're thinking about cyber, it's even worse, right? I mean, you, if you're PayPal or a company like that, you're never going to get a cyber insurance. And, what ha and, and one of the reasons why is, is, is just like pandemics, how can the cyber insurance companies handle a loss when everybody could get hacked at the same time? Again, my house and your house, there's, there's no scenario short of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Tony, where your and I's house could be on fire tonight for the same reason. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. God. Let's, I mean, we're running out of disasters. Let's hope that's true. But there are plenty of reasons why you and I could both home, go home tonight and find out that we have a charge card at Sam's Club we didn't know about. Or we could both go home tonight and find out that our social security numbers are with the Russian mafia. Or we could both go home tonight and find out that we're quarantined until August. And so um, when you look at exposures like that, you, you start to think about, in fact, and I would encourage people if they think about pandemics and terrorism you know i've been working with a lot of fortune 500 risk managers that have helped me on this quest it's not just me and i can't name them if they want to step forward they can but they're talking about like why do we have to try and make it a peril specific trigger what about climate change what about fear what about risk velocity and fear don't we just need a government backstop for just whatever day we feel like 9 11 regardless of the cause pandemic terrorism plan of the eighth does it matter anymore i mean we're really seriously does it matter anymore and so you you think about that um that's what you would do. You basically, it's as simple as this, as I explained it to my son. You take the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act, where you got all this money, and I don't know about you, Tony, but I'm pretty terrified right now, and you get a Sharpie, and where it says terrorism, you write in pandemic, and then you do that. And then you just say certified pandemic, and then, and then they do it, and they pay losses just like they would under TRIA, exactly as if terrorism were the cause. You just cross out terrorism, write in pandemic, pay, 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 pay. Is that going to get enough money in the economy? I don't know, not necessarily, but what it will do is it will ungum business interruption event insurance markets. It will restore business interruption coverage. It will restore payroll for those that elected it. And you can do things like, hey, you know, I mean, Butler University, we didn't elect TRIA because we don't have a terrorism risk. And so you go back to people like us and you say, look, you can buy this retroactively at three times the price because you didn't know it was going to have pandemics in it. And, and you did it. And think about how good this is long term. Right now, people in New York and your high-value targets are the ones fronting the cost of TRIA. People like Butler University, we don't buy it. I was a risk manager for a cash company in Mill, Indiana. We didn't buy TRIA. Imagine if by purchasing TRIA, that was the only way to get pandemic coverage through the government. Now, all of a sudden, you got a bunch of people paying in TRIA that were never gonna, and, the, and you now have a bigger, better risk pool for terrorism. And by the way, because you bring in terrorism and pandemics that not help us, hopefully they're uncorrelated risks, Right, and you say, okay, bad year for terrorism, we got terrorism and pandemic money. Bad year for pandemic, we got terrorism and pandemic money. I mean, it's a classic portfolio. If it were me, I'd bring in the national flood insurance program. I'd bring in a cyber backstop. I mean, why is the insurance? Why is the federal government handling risks in silos when every insurance professional who's taken CPCU 500 knows you portfolio that? 
Well, yeah, that, 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 there we're, we're, we're going into, I mean, it's not the topic of the talk today, but definitely absolutely germane uh, to the conversation and, and to, to our usual audience of, of insurance professionals. It simply makes no sense how little risk management and insurance education we have in general, right? Only what, like 70 some programs in the country out of 3,500 colleges, yeah. it simply makes no sense, right? And most no. of them aren't even major programs. Uh, it, it, it truly, and, and at most uh, schools, uh, the uh, risk management one-on-one class is not required for all the business majors. Right. So, right, right, right ultimately, like, like, imagine calling yourself a, 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 a business major or a business grad or an MBA and having never taken an accounting class. It just, it would never happen, right? And somehow, most people with a business degree and thus most companies are ran with true. people with no risk management uh, I'll tell, you why that's, I'll tell you why that's true. I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this way more than any sane human should. But um, <laughs> when, you, when you have bad finance, you have no money. You know it immediately. If you have bad accounting, you're getting audited. Your accounting close takes too long. If you have bad marketing, well, you can ask Peloton about that. Um, um, if you have bad risk management, how would you know? Uh, how, many year, I, how, how many I, years was Bill Cosby a national treasure till he wasn't? And we found out that it was bad. And that's what how risk is. And now... That, you know, the only good thing that come from this is, you know, everybody, the reason people don't appreciate insurance is you've never had a claim. It's the only product you could buy and never respect it because you never got any value from it. Every yeah, single person in the tough. world now knows what a risk manager does. This should change the game for that. It, yeah. It, it, so, so, so this idea, and now it makes sense why it came from, 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 from one of your, of, your, of your students or a conjunction yeah, of, of, I just of your students. Yeah, homework. I because they're the only homework. people in the in the world. Well, the only people, the only people in in, in my world. Let's put it that way. Uh, that are encouraged to spend time thinking about extreme yeah. scenarios and how yeah. how those risks can be right. It's just not part of, the, of of what the rest of the world of the business world does. So so you guys had already thought about extreme scenarios like like this, which which is great. So okay, so 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 what? A couple of weeks ago, you you're sitting in your classroom or sitting at, at home in your office or, or whatever, and you go like, "Holy crap!" We have a solution for this. I'm no, going to phone the White House. Well, no, it, it, this is a very quixotic, Mr. Finn goes to Washington kind of online version of that, I guess. It's a very interesting story. So I got called by the Indianapolis Business Journal, Journal and Mickey Shuey, who I know well, and, and Mickey and I have worked on a couple stories in the past. I like him, uh, um, you know, a plucky young reporter. And, and he called to ask me how I felt about the NCA being canceled and whether that would be covered. And I know the risk manager of the NCAA well, and I don't speak for them, and I won't speak for them, but he's a smart guy. Let's just put it that way. He's a very smart guy. Um, he would do the kind of things that I would do. Um, in fact, I was his mentor when he was at Ball State, where he got his insurance and risk manager degree. So, you know, without knowing anything about the NCAA at all, I strongly suspect they would be fine. Um, but, but at the time, my initial reaction was like, no, that's not covered. And then I, and then I thought more about and I said, definitely, if it's covered there, it's not going to cover it anywhere else. Right. You're not, you know, really specialized risk managers at really specialized companies get pandemic insurance. I mean, if you have an FM Global Advantage form, you probably have some coverage. FM Global is a great policy. I love them. Um, their policy form probably responds in some kind of way to this. Um, you know, again, I haven't looked at one in a while. And, and, but I started to think about it. I thought, oh my God, you know, this thing could be covered. And, and, then, and then I started thinking about contingent business disruption and the domino effect. And then I got an email from President James Danko, our Butler University, and, and our university has done an amazing job. I want to take a second and commend them. The, the faculty has turned this into an online university in like three days. It's amazing. Professors that are like, you know, 80 years old, do you think they would even have to work out a calculator? They're online doing Zoom classes and freaking webinars and stuff. It's amazing. They're seeing like it. And, and, and our risk manager is a former alumni, Austin Oldham. So he's done a, a fantastic job managing this crisis. And, and President Danko, did what I think is smart. He prepared for the worst case scenario. We just said we're going to do all mine for the rest of the year. That's tough. We lost our basketball season. We had a great team. We lost commencement. We don't know how we're going to do that yet. But but everybody feels better because at least we know we have some certainty. That's I think what's been missing a little bit from this crisis response. But he sent out a memo, kind of the batten down the hatches memo. Like we might be out a lot of money, guys. You better suspend hiring. We better suspend contractors. Better suspend construction. Better suspend renovation. And I start thinking, well, who's going to pay their losses? And I thought, oh, my God, like Butler could be in serious trouble in River City. We're not going to be covered for this. And so I, I, I thought, I know how to fix this. I spent my whole career doing it. Any risk manager out there could do this. They're all busy right now. I'm just the only one who didn't, was on spring break. So America was lucky. Uh, <laughs> I love that. But I, uh, I, I, I went to 
our risk manager, Austin. I said, look, I think this would fix it. Austin's been a student of ours. So he's like, oh, yeah, sure it would. And I'm like, I don't know anybody. Could you see if President Danko could give this to somebody, anybody? And so Austin with the President Danko. President Danko asked me to write a memo, which was ultimately published by Risk and Insurance Magazine. And he sent it to Eric, Governor Eric Holcomb of Indiana. And he texted him and said, would you please read this? I think this is important. And um, I saw confirmation that Holcomb and his team had read it. And so with the credibility of, you know, if Holcomb thought it was good enough to read, then, then I took it to Risk and Insurance and they liked it. And so then I took it to some contacts that I have at various insurance companies and brokers. I'm very good at stirring up trouble. And, not, you know, they, like I said, they could come forward if they want to. But the insurance industry is a small industry. And here's one of the things you have to remember. I work with all the industry associations, so I can get to NAMIC and the big guy and CPC, all these guys with lickety split. I know most of the Fortune 500 risk managers. I know a lot of them on a first name basis. I know probably 30, 40 risk managers well. They're sitting next to CEOs right now. So for me to text somebody to be like, hey, you might want to look at this, have your CEO look at this and go pester Congress about it, that's what they did. And so I mobilized America's risk managers behind the scene to get to their CEOs, to get to their government relations folks, and to get this to Congress. I went to the, uh, uh, the law firm of Frost Brown Town in Kentucky. They know Senate Majority Lee McConnell. They got it to them. I went to IE Advisory and Wayne Allen and his folks. They got it to Vice President Pence and I believe Otis. And then I basically, it's funny, I sat in my recliner. I didn't want to do too many beers. I had one or two beers, so I kept it, you know, reasonable. And I watched that Joe Safari Tiger King. That's some great watching here if you're on uh, lockdown. And uh, um, I, I just sent the link to, if you're a risk manager of a cruise line, you probably got a note for me. If you're a risk manager of an arena, event, sports team, probably got a note for me. If you're government relations, you probably got a note for me. And I just kept working this social media. And I think what it is is these, you know, I've been in crisis meetings. It's got a bunch of people in stuffy suits saying important stuff and making five decisions an hour while I can text 55 people from my recliner. And that's what I did. So once I got in the media, then I wanted to get it out to the government. And then once I did that, I wanted to listen. I wanted to listen. How does the industry feel about this? I'm not trying to screw the industry. I hope they understand that. I really hope they understand that. I listen to them. Oh my God, they're worried that I want them to pay for this. No, I don't. I don't want the insurance industry to pay for this. No, 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 no. I want them to do what they do best, adjust claims. It doesn't, it could be an agreed value percentage. Just Take all the uncertainty off of Americans' balance sheets and suck it up through the insurance industry right into the federal government and then come up with whatever risk share deal you want to come up with. I don't care what it is. I don't have any vested interest in it. That's why you should listen to me. I'm, I'm the last honest man, Tony. I, you know, as Mr. Smith went to Washington, I don't have any skin in the game. If anything, I make a mint off being an expert witness in coverage litigation. So once I understood what the insurance industry's concerns were, I made sure that I adapted my message to address those concerns and make sure they understood that I'm, I'm there for you. I'm trying to help you. I even had one of the associations reach out to me and say, we really appreciate the way you kind of adapted your message. We don't necessarily think Congress is going to do it, but we appreciate that. And, and, and then, you know, now, now that, now that the media trade media is engaged, now the government's engaged, now the insurance industry is engaged, now it's time to get the fortune 500 engaged. So one of my good friends from high school is chief of staff to one of the major founders, one of the major companies that's out there. I mean, it turns out I know a lot of really interesting people that know interesting people. I don't really know anybody anything direct. And what's ironic is I have I have not spoken to one single person directly in local, state, or national government. My mayor, my senator, my congressman, I've left them messages. They don't call me. They don't talk to me. Hey, I live in your district. I have four insurance degrees and 20 years experience adjusted business disruption claims. And I just did a bill you're looking at. Would you want to say hi to me or at least ask me anything? Nope. So, Nothing. So uh, quick, 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 quick pause so you can take a breath. Exactly. You can take a drink of water. Uh, so it's absurd. I, 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 I fully believe that you, your congressman, senator, et cetera, they get a voicemail that, 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 that says insurance expert. You can describe that insurance expert like, like 70, like you, whatever level of insurance expert, unless there's been a recent physical catastrophe, a tornado or something going through the district, you immediately got deleted. Anyway, keep going. <laughs> Well, think about that. That's the problem, though. Think about that. If if I was if I was a you know if this was an accounting crisis and I was an accountant, would they take my call? Is it a lack of understanding about of insurance? I mean, you know, I don't know if I, if I need surgery, I'm going to go to a doctor. I mean, not that I need to be involved. I don't want to be involved. I don't want to go to D.C. But but I want to help and I want to serve my country and I want to do what's right and I want to see that my friends that aren't getting paid. Um, you know, I have a student whose family owns an event company. Like this could ruin their company. If Congress passes this, it could save a student's company, literally. And, and this is the greatest generation of students, by the way. Let me talk about Kyle Nemec, a student whose family owns a, 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 a frozen food delivery company. And he's out delivering food 
20 hours a day and working in negative 40 degrees food storage and, and, and doing his classes online in the broom closet. And I got another student, I don't want to name her, but she has the flu and a compromised immune system. And she knew she was going to get the flu because her dad delivers medical supplies. And they agreed as a family that besides the risk to her, she would take it with grace and the dad would do that to get medical supplies to people that needed it. This is a girl now has a flu with a compromised immune system, taking that for a country. Kyle, who's delivering food and doing his class in a broom closet, working at a 40 degree freezer instead of having his college graduation and senior parties, he's doing that for his country. Where's that in the news? That's the story of these damn students. This is the greatest generation being minted before our eyes. And it'll be stronger than steel because it's been forged in the fire of adversity. And where's that story? That's the story. The, I'm just the, 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 they, the work for some kids. I, 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 I will give I, I will give Gen Zers uh, a full credit that that especially compared to us spoiled millennials who who grew up with much less adversity uh, in, in a much less complicated world. For a minute, I mean, if you're in the class of 2020, you lost your prom, your graduation. Holy, your I can't. Yeah, they lost I, more I, than anybody else, and nobody's talking about that. They deserve that. They deserve someone to recognize their loss. I can I can only imagine. So, so the, the, the tree idea, yeah. how, how far are we and what can the audience do to help push this forward? How far are we from when I tune in to, to uh, the president's da daily uh, uh, coronavirus update slash rally, because that's kind of what he makes them to. And I can't do a, a Trump impression, but, but how far are we from, from, from him proudly talking about how we're going to push this, this through? I don't know. Um, I'll tell you what I think. I'll tell you what I think I know. And, and again, this comes back to the fact, and, and again, I don't have to be, I, it seems like I'm being helpful. That's all I really care about, to be honest with you. And I'm saying things and putting things out there and the trade media, media is really helping me. Um, I got to, I got the first chance to work with the Washington Post yesterday. I got a little mention from them today, which was awesome. So, you know, I, I think what, what people can do is reach out to their Congress folks and their representatives and say, we want this. This makes sense. This is good for the industry. I mean, that's what we, what we really need people to do, and I'm sorry I forgot your original question because I kind of got off on a little tangent there too. It's been it's every day's like six months with this whole virus. Bite. So, so basically, the call to action to our audience, which is likely mostly made out of out of, out of uh, insurance and risk management people, is hey, grab the 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 article from. For, I'll include I'll include some of the articles you you've been you've been featured in recently. Uh, hey, grab the article from the show notes. Share it with your congressman. Let them know that this is yeah, important. I mean, look, I look at it this way. Somebody asked me, like, uh, Meg Green at AMBES asked me if I wanted to debate somebody who's against it. And I was like, no, nah, I don't really want to. Um, I'm not trying to be a public figure in this. I've said my piece, right? Everything, I, everything you need to know that I have to say about this on LinkedIn, right? That's it. And, and people have gotten those ideas, and they're going to respond to them or not. And I, I liken it this way. If I'm wrong, they won't do it. But if I'm right and I don't say anything, I'll never be able to live myself for a multitude of reasons because it's bad for the country, because someone else – you know, get something cool out of it that I could have had. I mean, you know, I'm not worried about that, but that's, that's part of it too. I'm worried about my family and our future. I got to make lemonade out of these lemons as best I can for me, for Butler. I mean, and I look at it this way, even if the Congress doesn't do it, Butler's better. Butler's going to be getting some reputational bump out of this. Maybe some kids are thinking about leaving and won't leave. Maybe some kids will want to come here. It'd be good for the David risk manager program. It'd be good for Gamma Auto Sigma. It'd be good for insurance industry to recognize the value of people who have my education and experience. That's a that's already a bigger win than I ever mm -hmm. hoped I'd ever get in my whole life, and so that I know is going to happen. And 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 I would call the industry. I would give a call action to the insurance industry. If 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 this ends up helping you, what I'm doing, then write a million dollar check to an insurance company program in Gamma Auto Sigma. It doesn't have to be Butler. We've been trying to get a center to replicate this other places, but anywhere you want to send it, I don't care. To help make Noel Cota's body's job easier at Gamma Auto Sigma. That's how we can make a win out of this. Now. There will be a pandemic risk insurance act going forward. There has to be. It's just a simple common sense insurance. You, you have to have it. You can't have it. You can't have that cancellation. You can't think about any convention, any event, any cruise line, any airline, any anybody who could be shut down for two to four weeks and, and what they would have to do. I mean, there's things you could do around our supply chain. So when I, when I had a, a company in New Orleans and we worried about hurricane season, we looked at our biggest shutdown. It was two weeks. So we pumped up our inventory two weeks ahead of current case season. We used the carrying cost as part of the cost of risk, and then we bled the inventory down. So maybe now U.S. manufacturing has to focus on more of a seasonal manufacturing. We build up two weeks of inventory in the summer, and we all have to carry around two weeks of inventory during cold and flu season in case we have to do this every two or three years. That could be a way to handle it. You don't necessarily have to do it. An expensive way, way to handle it. It would be, uh, but maybe yeah. that's – but and, 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 and you don't have to do it, but then again, maybe that's what your shareholders want. Maybe that's the world we live in. 
I think is good for America. I think you're going to see a lot of people rethinking their supply chains and whether they should have really wrung every molecule of earnings per share out of those supply chains and bring that stuff back into the U.S. So I think long term, you know, with respect to anybody who died or suffered, we feel so terrible for them. But long term, I think this would be, you know, hopefully, again, you got to find the positive. There's some good things for the country. But what I would say for the insurance industry that's listening is think about my motivation, right? I don't have stock in anything of any meaningful level. I own normal shares in normal companies. Some of you, some of you not. Um, in fact, if, if, if I have shares in you, that's probably a good indicator to figure out how I feel about you. But I'm not going to tell anybody that. Um, um, but I don't have any financial interest in this. I'm just telling you what I think's right. You could, you know, it's what, it's what I used to tell. Actually, I used to love to tell this to Richard Smucker. I'd say, uh, my job is to tell you what the risk is, tell you how bad it is, and give you a recommendation. And if I feel strongly about it, I'll give you a recommendation again. But at the end of the day, it's not the JM Penn company. You can do whatever the hell you want. I don't care. And that's basically how I feel about this. America, I've given you the idea. You do whatever you want with it or not. But if you're an insurance agent, you should think about it. Should, should I reasonably have had a duty to know about pandemic insurance? Because I looked at this in 2010. I signed off. I had my management sign off in 2010. We don't have pandemic insurance. It does exist. You sure you don't want it? So if you didn't do that, what's your exposure as an agent? If you didn't do that, what's your exposure as a risk manager to a shareholder lawsuit? If, if, if you're an insurance company, have you ever paid a claim and said inventory was damaged because it was dirty because it was a lot easier than trying to do a full-blown you know, salvage operation and you use that to, to just, all right, get a total loss. It's dirty. It's damaged. Are you going to regret that term dirty? That'll be what brings them down, dirty. I know I had a $15 million claim settled because it was damaged because it was quote unquote dirty. And when you start talking about virus and cleanliness and there ain't no hand sanitizer in this country, I'm not, it's not my industry to gamble with. I'll be the guy in the big short. I'll just, you know, plan my investments accordingly if they don't do this. And then I'll get Steve Carell or somebody to play me in that movie later. But um, honestly, that's where I'm at with this. I mean, I'm kind of tired of you guys. I mean, I've given you my advice. You're going to do it or you're not. And I hope you do. That's it. <laughs> I don't want to be a national figure. My goal is I got like one more interview, a couple more phone calls. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm standing down next week. It's back to business as usual. We're covering work topic guys. Okay. So we covered quite a bit of stuff there. Yeah, we usually do uh, with me. <laughs> uh, that, that's been, it's been very, very interesting. And, uh, uh, thank you so much for, for, for your time. Uh, thank you for, for, I, I, I wish that every insurance professional, every risk management professional was as passionate about what we do and as vocal as you are. And the, it, it would, if we had, you know, 20 uh, professors sacks, even if they weren't professors, but we do, uh, we had, but we do, but let me say that, you know what we do? We do. We have, we have, uh, uh Deb, Deb Richardson at the University of North Texas. We have Dr. Rob Brennan at Temple University. We have Dr. Steve Avila at Ball State University. We have uh, Dr. Kathleen McCall at Florida State. So that's my point in this. There are more of me, but now we have to make more of all of them because there's things that Drennan knows that I'll never know, right? There's things that Avila knows that I'll never know. And, and, that, and that's what risk management is all about. That's why when anybody feels like, oh, I don't have an insurance degree, he's crapping on me. That's not true. Some of the brightest people I've ever met in the insurance have philosophy degrees, music degrees, they, every, the majority, just, yeah. every kind of background in this. And, and anybody who's doing anything right now to help this situation is, is a hero. And that's what I love about our industry. Finance and accounting are great, but in our industry, we keep bad things from having to good people, and we put bad things back together again. That's a noble Get problem. them back on their feet. There exactly. And, and we never get credit for it. <laughs> well, you know what? Maybe this time we will. Maybe it's be the world's largest I told you so. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Sack, for, for, for joining me today. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and say goodbye there. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, for tuning in. I will include in the show notes a link to, to Professor Sack's uh, LinkedIn, to the Butler program, Gamma Gata Sigma, and I'll, 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 try, I'll try to link the ton of people that you mentioned. Uh, that might take a while, but, but I'll, 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 hopefully that, that'll help us uh, make this thing go wild. And uh, uh, this might be the only episode of Purpose and Risk for our dear listeners ever that makes sense, share it outside of, of, of the industry. Uh, it truly uh, it was kind of meant for, for general consumption. And if, if, uh, if we can make a positive difference in the world, this is exactly what, what we're here for as an industry. So, so it really fits in well. Uh, thank you and goodbye. Yeah, so, thank you very much, Tony. I appreciate it.